let me begin by saying that our method is first to outline a book of the Bible when we begin a study of it. And we have outlined the epistle to the Romans. The broad outline is we have it divided into three sections. The first eight chapters, it's doctrinal, and faith is the subject. Salvation by faith. Justification by faith. And then in Romans 9, 10, and 11, we have a dispensational section that deals with the nation Israel. It's past, it's present, and it's future. And then in Romans 12 through 16, the subject is duty. Those that have been justified by faith have a duty. And we'll see as we move along that we break down each one of these sections. fact of the matter is that when I go out to hold a conference and teach the epistle to the Romans... I have an altogether different outline that I use. I divide it something like this. First, salutation, first 17 verses of chapter 1. The next is sin, verse 18, chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 20. Salvation is the third division, beginning with verse 21 of chapter 3 through 10th verse of chapter 5. Then sanctification is the fourth division, chapter 5, verse 11, through the 23rd verse of chapter 6. Then struggle, chapter 7. Then spirit-filled living, chapter 8, 1 through 27. And then security, chapter 8, verse 28 through 39. Then we have segregation, chapters 9 through 11. And then sacrifice and service, chapters 12 and 13. Separation, chapters 14 and 15. And then a closing salutation in chapter 16. And that is, again, a very simple division of this book. Now, as we come to this very marvelous, wonderful book of Romans, there are two matters I'd like to talk about. And one is the man who wrote the epistle and the city to which he wrote the epistle. And, of course, when we get into the epistle, we'll see the third great matter, and that is the subject, which, of course, is the righteousness of God. Now, let me say just a word concerning Paul the apostle. We have actually come now to a different method of revelation. God has used many ways to communicate to man. He gave the Pentateuch, the law, through Moses. He gave history. He gave poetry. He gave prophecy. He gave the Gospels. And we come to a new section, and their are epistles. Dr. Dysmon tried to make a division between epistles and letters. He wrote a very ponderous tome, like from the ancient East, and he examined the papyri that was found at Oxyrhynchus in Egypt. And he tried to make a division that a great many scholars today think is entirely false. And therefore, Paul's epistle to the Romans is an epistle. And it's a letter. You don't make a division like that. It becomes very personal. And these letters that we have, these epistles, they are so warm and so personal that as far as you and I are concerned, it's just as if it came by special delivery mail to us today. And the Lord is speaking to us in each one of these very wonderful letters that Paul wrote to these different churches and the other apostles also. Now, Paul makes this statement in the 15th chapter of Romans at verse 15. Let me read this. Nevertheless, brethren... I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that's given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul makes it very clear that he was the apostle to the Gentiles. He also makes it very clear that Simon Peter was the 
apostle to the nation Israel. He says, for instance, in Galatians, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9, he says, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. Therefore you see that Paul was peculiarly the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, when you read the last chapter of Romans and see all those people that Paul knew, most of them are Gentiles. The church in Rome was largely a Gentile church. Now, Paul also makes it very clear that if somebody else had founded the church in Rome, he would never have gone there. He says, for instance, that he was eager to go there. He says, so as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now, he wanted to go to Rome to preach the gospel. And in the 26th chapter of Acts, verse 17, why the Lord who appeared to Paul told him as he gave his great message to Agrippa, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles under whom now I send thee to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me." Now, Paul makes it also very clear he'd never have gone to Rome, although he was eager to go, if anyone else had preached the gospel ahead of him. In Romans 15, verse 20, he says, "...yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation." And Paul just didn't go where no other apostle had been. So no one had been to Rome. Now, that leads me to say a word about Rome. And the question is, who founded the church in Rome? And I'm going to make a rather unusual statement here. And the statement is this. Paul is the one who founded the church in Rome. And he founded it by radar. And somebody says, you don't mean that. Well, may I say, he founded it by long-distance telephone. And somebody says, well, they didn't have radar, and they didn't have telephones then. Well, may I say to you, that's the best way I can describe it. And let me make it very clear. You see, Rome was a tremendous city, and Paul had never been there. No other apostle had been there. And yet a church came into existence. How did it come into existence? Well, Paul, as he moved throughout the Roman Empire, was winning men and women to Christ. And Rome had a strong drawing power. And many people were in Rome that had met Paul out in the Roman Empire. Somebody says, do you know that? Oh, we have a very striking example of that. Over in the 18th chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 3, we find Paul going to Corinth. And who did he meet there? Listen to this. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, and he came to Corinth, found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Now, Paul met Aquila and Priscilla. Their home was in Rome, but there had been a wave of anti-Semitism, and we find that Claudius, the emperor, had persecuted them, and now this couple left Rome. They came to Corinth. We find later that they went with Paul to Athens. And they became real witnesses for Christ. Then when Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans, they had returned back to Rome and Paul sends greetings to them. Now we have 
this very personal word in Acts concerning this couple. What about the others there? Well, Paul knew them. That means he'd met them somewhere, and he'd led them to Christ, friends. Paul is the founder of the church at Rome by long distance, by leading folk to Christ, and then they gravitate to Rome. And let me read to you something I wrote many years ago in a little book entitled One Hour in Romans, and it's about Rome. I'd like for you to hear this. Paul knew Rome, although he had not been inside her city limits at the time of the writing of Romans. Rome was like a great ship passing in the night, casting up waves that broke on distant shores. Her influence was like a radio broadcast, penetrating every corner and crevice of the empire. Paul had visited Roman colonies, such as Philippi and Thessalonica, and there he had seen Roman customs, laws, language, styles, and culture on exhibit. He'd walked on Roman roads. He'd met Roman soldiers on the highways and in the marketplaces, and he'd slept in Roman jails. Paul had gone before Roman magistrates. He'd enjoyed the benefits of Roman citizenship. You see, Paul knew all about Rome, although he was yet to visit there. From the vantage point of the world's capital, he was to preach the global gospel to a lost world that God so loved so much that he gave his Son to die, that whosoever believed on him might not perish but have eternal life. Rome was like a great magnet. It drew men and women from the ends of the then-known world to its center. As Paul and the other apostles crisscrossed in the hinterland of this colossal empire, they brought multitudes to the foot of the cross. Churches were established in most of the great cities of this empire. In the course of time, many Christians were drawn to the center of this great juggernaut. A saying that all roads lead to Rome was more than just a bromide. As Christians congregated in this great metropolis, a visible church came into existence. Probably no man established a church in Rome. Converts of Paul and the other apostles from the fringe of the empire went to Rome, and a local church was organized by them. Certainly, Peter did not establish the church or have anything to do with it, as his sermon on Pentecost and following sermons were directed to Israelites only. Not until the conversion of Cornelius was Peter convinced that Gentiles were included in the body of believers. Now we find that Paul is the one now writing to the Romans. He also was to visit Rome later on. He also was the one who knew Rome, and he's the founder of the church in Rome. Now, we find that this great epistle, and the reason I feel so totally inadequate, is because of its great theme, which is the righteousness of God. And it is a message that I have attempted over the years to proclaim. And it is the message, by the way, that the world today as a whole does not want to hear it, nor will it want to accept. The world likes to hear, friends, about the glory of mankind. It likes to have mankind exalted, not God. Now, I'm convinced in my own thinking that any ministry today that attempts to teach the glory of man and does not present the total depravity of the human heart and does not reveal that man is totally corrupt, and that man is a ruined creature, that that teaching that does not deal with that great truth will not lift mankind, nor will it offer a remedy. Because of the fact the only remedy for man's sin today is the perfect remedy that we have in Christ, which God has provided for a lost race. And that is the great message of Romans. Now, I can illustrate that, and I want to do it in a very personal way. About the time that 
I had just returned from Europe and Bible lands, and I actually came home a day early because I had been asked by the widow of Audie Murphy, the most decorated hero of World War II, to take his funeral as he'd been killed in a plane crash. And I had known his wife as she had been attending the church I served in Los Angeles for over 10 years. And I saw this young woman as she came to a knowledge of Christ and then began to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. Now, she wanted me to present a gospel message at the funeral service. And it was made very clear to me I'd be in enemy territory. Now, the chaplain there, and he was a very fine man, sound in the faith, he was asked to give the obituary notice and the eulogy. And he did as it was proper. He mentioned the distinguished service cross. He mentioned all of the medals that this young man had received. And I want to tell you, he deserved every one of them. He was a brave young man. He was the outstanding hero of World War II. He deserved every bit of it. But when I got up, I presented the gospel that men are saved not by anything they do, but something that God has done. And God has us all shut into a cross, and he's not asking the world to do anything. He's just asking the world one question, what will you do with my son who died for you? And that that was the all-important question. And though this man had heard the gospel, and he had the example of his wife before him, and all of that, and also the testimony of his two sons, he had not accepted it publicly as far as we know. But in that awesome and traumatic moment when that plane was plunging to the ground, that all of that must have come before him. He knew the facts of the gospel, and that if in that moment he turned to Christ, he was saved. And he saved as much as anybody has ever been saved. Because the Lord Jesus said, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And friends, may I say to you that the thief on the cross... Why, the Roman Empire said he wasn't fit to live in the Roman Empire, and they were executing him. The Lord Jesus said, I'm going to make you fit for heaven, and today thou shalt be with me in paradise. God takes lost sinners like I am, like you are, and brings you into the family of God, makes you a son of God. And he does it because of his death upon the cross, and not because there's anything in us or any merit in us whatsoever. That's the great message of Romans, and this is the message. It was Godet, the Swiss commentator, who said, The Reformation was certainly the work of the epistle to the Romans, and that of the Galatians also. And it is probable that every great spiritual renovation in the church will always be linked, both in cause and in effect, to a deeper knowledge of this book. It was Martin Luther who wrote the epistle to the Romans as the true masterpiece of the New Testament and the very purest gospel, which is well worth and deserving that a Christian man should not only learn it by heart, word for word, but also that he should daily deal with it as the daily bread of men's souls. It can never be too much or too well read or studied. And the more it's handled, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. It was Chrysostom, one of the early church fathers, who had it read to him twice a week. Coleridge said that the epistle to the Romans is the most profound writing that exists. And you find that actually one of the great scientists turned to this book, and he found in it that it gave a real faith. It was Michael Faraday. And this man was asked on his deathbed by a reporter, said, what are your speculations now? He says, I have no speculation. He says, my faith is firmly 
fixed in Christ my Savior, who died for me, who's made a way for me to go to heaven. This is the epistle that turned that Bedford tinker by the name of John Bunyan. I walked through the cemetery where he's buried, and I thought of what that man had done and said. You know, he was no intellectual giant, and he was not a poet, but he happened to write a book, my friend, that only one book has ever exceeded it in sales. That's the Bible, and it's Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. May I say to you that it's the story of a sinner that's saved by grace, and that sinner was John Bunyan. And the record, it just happens to be that this man read and studied the epistle to the Romans, and he told its story, its profound story, in his own life story, story of pilgrim, of how he came to the cross and the burden of sin rolled off. And he began that journey to the celestial city. Now, friends, we come today to the epistle to the Romans proper. And now we are in this section where we are looking at the introduction to this marvelous epistle. And we'll find out that even the introduction or the salutation, as some like to speak of it here, but We have here in the introduction the first 17 verses, and that's divided like this. We have Paul's personal greeting in the first seven verses. Then we have Paul's personal purpose in verses 8 through 13, and then Paul's three I am's, 14 through 17. Now, as we come here to verse 1, we hope you'll follow us rather carefully as we go through this epistle. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, you will notice, first of all, that the little verb to be is in italics, which means it's not in the manuscripts. It's not in the original. And it should be Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called an apostle and separated under the gospel of God. Now, Paul identifies himself here in this epistle as a servant, and the word is doulos, and it means a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Now, he is here an apostle, but first of all, he calls himself a servant. Now, that's very important to see. It's important to see for the very simple reason that he took this place willingly. The Lord Jesus Christ, friends, he's loved us and he's given himself for us. But the very interesting thing is that he never makes you his slave at all. You have to do that voluntarily. Come to him and make yourself a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is something that is wonderful beyond measure. When he saves you, why, he won't force you actually to serve him. If you'll notice that he said even to Jerusalem, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times I would have gathered you, just like a mother hen gathers her little chicks under her wings, But you would not. And the Lord Jesus said on one occasion, you remember, he says, you'll not come to me that you might have life. He won't force you. You have to do this on your own. You have to come to him, but you have the privilege of making yourself a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Now you'll recall that when Paul was saved, the thing that was said to him on the Damascus Road First of all, he asked, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. He came to know him as his Savior. And then his question was, What will you have me to do? That is the one. And that is the time he made himself a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something that is quite wonderful, by the way. Now, will you notice that he also says here, 
that he's not only a servant of Jesus Christ, but he is an apostle, and he's a called apostle. It doesn't mean he was called to be an apostle. It means this is the kind of an apostle that he was, that the Lord Jesus had called him to be an apostle, and he was called into that office. He didn't choose it. The Lord Jesus told him that he was to be his witness. And this man now, first of all, made himself a servant, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. But now he is a called apostle. And that's the only kind of a servant God's going to use, by the way, one that he has chosen. There are too many men, I'm afraid, actually in the ministry today, that God didn't call him at all. Paul could say, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And you remember Jeremiah, he was called even as a little child. But he could say to the false prophets, and God said to them, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. He was a called apostle. Now, an apostle is one who had seen the resurrected Christ. Paul had seen him. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that he had appeared to him as one born out of due season. But also there was another mark of an apostle of that day, and that was an apostle had what we call the sign gifts. Paul said that he could speak in tongues. Now, I believe that when he went through that Galatian country, and came over into the area along the Aegean Sea, where there were so many Greek cities, so many tribes, so many peoples, that he was unable to speak the language of each tribe as he came among them. He spoke in tongues. He was an apostle. And then he had the gift of healing, a gift that we do not believe is in existence today. God heals today directly. I tell folk, I took my case directly to the great physician. I didn't take it to one of the interns. I took it to the great physician. And I think that today God healed. But he doesn't give that gift today to man. But Paul had that gift. And he not only had the gift of healing, he could raise the dead. And that was the mark of an apostle. Peter raised the dead. Paul raised the dead, you see. Now, Paul is a bond slave of Jesus Christ. He's a called apostle. And now the third thing that is said here, he's separated under the gospel of God. And I want you to notice this, because this is a remarkable thing. He was separated unto, and not separated from something, but separated unto the gospel of God. And it's God's gospel because he originated. The gospel, you see, is something God thought of. I didn't think of it. Man didn't think of it. The Lord didn't say 1,900 years ago, well, I know it's the fullness of time, and it's time for Jesus to come into the world, but maybe Vernon McGee won't like it. Maybe he's got a better program, and we'll wait till he gets here. He didn't do that at all. (laughs) I got here, and the gospel had been in existence 1,900 years it's God's gospel. And he said that to me, he says, you take it or leave it. And by the way, he's saying that to you. You take it or leave it. He originated the gospel. But Paul says he's separated unto the gospel. Not separated from something, but separated unto. And this is a very marvelous word, by the way. Separated unto. And there are several words that almost have an opposite meaning. For instance, you take the word cleave. A thing can cleave to something, or you can cleave a thing asunder. It actually can mean one time to join together, and another time it can mean to separate. Now, the word separated. We hear so much today about this matter of separation. Well, Paul was a separated Christian, but he is separated to something, not from something. And I'm afraid that we've got a great many Christians that are separated from something. In fact, when I hear some talk, I have an idea they're doing a spiritual strip tease. They say, I've taken this off. I don't do this. I don't do that. 
Well, my friend, what are you separated unto? Not what you're separated from. And the important thing is to be separated unto something. Now, Paul said about the Thessalonians, how they turned to God from idols. They didn't get up in a testimony meeting and say, oh, I don't go to the temple of Apollo anymore. They didn't need to say that. They were separated unto the Lord Jesus. And when they're separated unto him, why, you don't need to be separated from something. I hear people today say, should a Christian be separated from something? And they mention something. And I think there's so many barren lives. They get separated from something, and they're joyless, and they become very critical, and some even very cynical. My friend, you're to be separated unto Christ. Now, when you're separated unto Christ, then the separation from takes place. A man gets married. I have in my marriage ceremony. Do you promise to love and to keep yourself under her or under him and no one else. And that's separation, separated under one person. That's what marriage is. Well, imagine a fellow getting married, and the first night of his honeymoon, he says to his new bride, he says, i got a girlfriend in this town. I think I'll call her up and go over to see her. And there are a lot of Christians that that's the kind of separation they have, you see. It's a separation from something, but not under something. And if you're separated under the Lord Jesus, then, my friend, you're not going to worry about this separated from something. And the very interesting thing is it means that you've got a life that appeals, not one that turns people off. A lot of people turn the unsaved off by their lives. There was a little Chinese girl once said, you know, says Christians are salt. Salt makes you thirsty. That's the one to think over, friend. By the way, are you and I making anybody thirsty for Christ? He's the water of life. Do we make them thirsty? And by the way, this word separated is a very interesting word. In my notes, I talk about this word for it occurs again a little later on, but it's the same word we get our word horizon from. And it's aphorizo, and it means it would be off or from horizon. I always, in taking a plane trip, have noticed something that when the plane takes off, it brings you up to places where the horizon gets enlarged. I remember that taking off in Athens. And when we took off, my, you couldn't see anything. I tried to see the Acropolis. I tried to see the ocean. I couldn't see a thing. We hadn't gone very far. You could see the ocean. You could see the Acropolis. You could see the islands. You could see the mountains. You could see it all when you get up there. The higher we went, why, the wider the horizon got. And how wonderful it is to be separated under Christ because he brings you to the place where your horizons are enlarged. And you're given a new life in Christ Jesus. And how wonderful that new life is. It brings you to a new place and appreciation of life. This is what I mean. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I acted as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, there was a time when I can recall as a boy that I used to play house because there were a bunch of girls in the neighborhood. And there were only a couple of us boys. And so in order to play, we played house. Well, there came a day, friends, when I outgrew that stuff. And I went out and played baseball. And the girls would say, let's play house. And I said, no, I'm playing first base on the team. I'm not interested in that. A new horizon. And then there came a day when I not only not interested in playing baseball, I can't play baseball. But the thing is that I'm interested in something else. Horizons have widened out. And if you come to Christ, you're separated unto him. Separation doesn't mean you're drawn in and you become little and narrow. 
Why, it means, friends, that your life has broadened out, and today there's so many wonderful things that you can do as a child of God, and you can have an appreciation of things today. May I say to you that it's thrilling to live today. What a glorious, wonderful thing it is. Now, he says here he's separated under the gospel of God. And this is a wonderful verse. And he said, this is not something, the gospel is not just brand new. It was promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And that means that if you go back into the Old Testament, that you'll find out that it was promised all the way through the Old Testament. And it is a message that God loves, that's good news, that God loves mankind, and that God today is saving mankind. What a wonderful thing that it is. It brings you into a love relation. And we're going to see in this epistle that salvation is a love affair. He loved us, and we love him because he first loved us. And whom having not seen, we love, Simon Peter said. And Paul made it very personal. He said, he loved me and he gave himself for me. How wonderful. Now we come here to that which some have put in a parenthesis. But it's one of the greatest statements that we have here. And we're told what the gospel is that was promised in the Holy Scriptures. It's concerning his son, Jesus Christ. And the word concerning is the little preposition peri. And you have that in periscope or perimeter, and it just means that which encircles. The gospel is all about Jesus Christ. It's what he's done. It's his work. And it's concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You have his full title here. He's the Son of God, and he's Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is his wonderful name. It's what he's done. We hear a great deal. Liberalism has talked for years about what we need is to have the religion of Jesus. Well, he had no religion. He didn't need one. He was God. What we need today is to have a religion that's about Jesus, all about him, surrounds him. It's what he's done. Jesus Christ, actually, he was God. <laughs> He cannot worship. He is to be worshipped. Somebody says, but he prayed. Well, he took the place, actually, of humanity, and he did that for your sake and my sake. And when he prayed, he did it as a means of accommodation. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean simply this. You remember at the grave of Lazarus? It says, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by and said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. That's John eleven forty one and 42. My friend, he prayed for your benefit and my benefit today to help our faith. But he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, will you notice, we have something else wonderful that's said about him here. He is of the seed of David, according to the flesh. That's the humanity of Jesus. And he's declared not to be, because he always was. He's declared the Son of God with power. You see, what happened was that the resurrection did not make him the Son of God. It just revealed what he was. And here we have that same word, horizon, that we've had before. And he's declared, he's horizon, the Son of God. We have the perfect humanity of Christ here and the perfect deity of Christ here. And the oldest creed in the church said he's very man of very man and he's very God of very God. And Paul said it before the creed said it, my friend. Here it is here. And he's not any more man because he's God and he's not any less God because he's man. He is the theanthropic person. He's the God-man. Now, it's according to the spirit of holiness. Now, I personally believe here the reference is to the Holy Spirit. 
I think that you have the Trinity set before us here. I think that you have here the Trinity. It's concerning his son, Jesus Christ. And he's the son of God, declared to be with power according to the spirit of holiness. And you have the Holy Spirit here. And it's by the resurrection from the dead. May I say to you, the resurrection proves everything. It is that which sets him forth here as the Son of God. The resurrection, I think it proves something, and it sets him forth. Now, will you notice that we have the Trinity set before us? We have the deity of Christ set before us. We have the virgin birth set before us. He's of the seed of David according to the flesh. And that's the reason that you have two genealogies. One genealogy is in Matthew. That's a Joseph. He got the legal title from Joseph. But I want to tell you, he got the blood title from Mary, because he's in the line of Mary, and that's her genealogy that's in the Gospel of Luke. He is the God-man. There are those that say Paul never taught the virgin birth. I'd like to know what you have here. This is not the virgin birth. Now, friends, we have gotten down to verse 5, and I'm sure that already that you recognize the importance of this section of Scripture. It's very important. It was Dr. William Kelly who made this statement. He says, take any part of the Old Testament and compare it with these opening words of Romans 1. How evident. And immense the difference, aim, character, and scope. What is there, for instance, like it in the five books of Moses? Are the historical books that follow? In vain do you search the Psalms and other poetical books for a parallel. Not even the prophets describe or predict such a state of things. Glorious things are spoken for Israel. Mercy from God, which will not fail to reach and bless the poor Gentiles, deliverance and joy for the long travailing earth and lower creation in general. All this and more we've abundantly from the prophets and even in the Psalms, but there's nothing resembling the tone even of the apostles' salutation and preface to the Roman saints. And that's the reason we're spending time with this, because, my friend, it is so wonderful. And it is the gospel that was promised afore by the prophets in the Old Testament. And it's the gospel of God because he originated it. I didn't, neither did Paul. And it's a gospel that concerns his son, Jesus Christ. And that little word concern means it's all around him, all about him. It's a person. And you see, today, there's a difference between religion and real Christianity. Christianity actually is not a religion, it's a person. And that person is Jesus Christ, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, we've seen that Paul states the virgin birth here. He was made a born of the seed, the sperm of David, according to the flesh. My friend, this is his humanity. And he's virgin born because he's declared... He's marked out, he's horizoned, not to be, but he is the Son of God with power. And all of this is according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus confirms everything. It proves everything. If you read the Bible through, you will discover that it presents the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of his resurrection. First, he's seen in the days of his flesh walking upon the earth. He's despised and rejected of man, even walking in weakness where he sits down and rests at a well. And he's finally brought to ignominy and shame and death upon that cursed cross. That's where we see him first, my friend. But the very interesting thing is that though he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, there came a time when he's raised from the dead. And may I say it proved that he's accurate when he said, "Year from beneath 
I am from above, ye are of this world, I'm not of this world. And so that body came forth from the grave. Death cannot keep its prey, Jesus, my Savior. And when he's hanging there on the cross, he looked down and said to his human mother, he said, Woman, behold thy son. You see, that first miracle yonder, up yonder in Cana, Galilee, and in that town he performed a miracle, but he said to her, Woman, my hour's not yet come. But hanging now on the cross, he can look down at her and say, Behold your son, mine hour now is come. The days of walking through the dusty roads of that land are over now, and he's coming back from the dead in mighty power. And that is the thing that proved, if you please, his virgin birth, proves he's the Son of God that he said who he is. And then there's a second great truth here. We see him as the resurrected Christ presently, seated upon the right hand of God in the heavens, interceding today for his church, for believers, and giving them power and comforting him. And I'm confident that the statement that has been made, there's a man in the glory, but the church has lost sight of him, that is something today that needs to be recovered. What does he mean to you today, friend? And that's important. Is the living Christ one you're having contact with? And then we see here by his resurrection, he's coming as the judge and the king, king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to put down sin and he's going to reign in righteousness on this earth. And he's going to judge the earth. And he's going to judge mankind. That is what Paul said to those glib, sophisticated Athenian philosophers. He said, We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he'll judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he's raised him from the dead. May I say to you that a most solemn fact, my friend, is that because Jesus Christ came back from the dead, you will have to stand before him. You will either stand before him as one who's trusted him as your Savior, or you'll stand before him in judgment. And the very fact that you have not accepted him, may I say, the condemnation of God must be upon you. And the resurrection is the pledge and guarantee that you're going to have to face the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't stand before him in your own righteousness. You must be condemned to a lost eternity unless you trust him as your Savior, my friend. Oh, how important and how thrilling this is. Now, Paul goes on here, and we see in verse 5, he says, "...by whom we have received grace." Now, I'm going to talk about grace. God saves us by grace. I've been saved by grace. That's God's method of salvation. We'll see that we've received grace. Would never have been saved if God had not been gracious. And apostleship. Now, apostleship means that, well, there were those that were technically apostles. But every believer is a sent one. And that's what apostello, apostle, means. One who's been sent. One who's a witness. One who has a message. And we've received grace and apostleship. And your life ought to be counting somewhere today. You ought to be doing something to get the Word of God out today. And I'm thrilled by it. And all over this land, there are men and women been waiting for a means, an avenue, to get the Word of God out. We have now several foundations that have put us on their list. Christian foundations, one man said, have been waiting for a means, an outlet, to get the Word of God out today. Now, we've received apostleship. What are you doing to get the Word of God out today? And that is the business 
of those we've received grace and we've received apostleship. Now, notice this next statement. For the obedience of faith among all nations for his name. Now, this is the obedience of faith. You'll go over to the very last chapter, and you're going to find again here in Romans this statement again about the obedience of faith. In verse 19 of chapter 16, "...for your obedience is come abroad unto all men." And then in next to the last verse, verse 26, he says, "...make known to all nations for the obedience of faith." Now, God saves us by faith, not by works. But after God has saved you, he wants to talk to you about your works, friends, and about your obedience unto him. There is a great deal of difference between this believism that the world's talking about today. There are a great many that talk about they believe in Jesus, and then they live like the devil, and they seem to be serving him. My friend... May I say to you, saving faith makes you obedient unto Jesus Christ. And somebody is going to say, well, is there a difference in faith? There surely is. You see, it's the object of faith. And the object of faith is Christ. And saving faith, that faith that trusts him, is a faith that will believe him, my friend. Let me put it like this. I believe in George Washington. I think he was a great man, first president, father of his country. And I believe in Jesus Christ. But faith in George Washington never done anything for me. It doesn't have anything to do with my salvation and very little to do with my life. But faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is something else. That's saving faith. Now, that saving faith means that you and I are brought to the place... And we come to the place where we surrender to the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There are a great many fundamentalists, racketeers running abroad. Oh, they give out the basic facts. They talk about the premillennial coming of Christ. And then there are the modernistic seducers today. My friend, doctrine is important, all important. But may I say that there is a discipline and a doing that goes along with it. And you couldn't be the salt of the earth without combining both of them. Living faith in Christ. By the way, have you ever thought of what salt is made of? Salt is made up of two poisons, sodium and chloride. And you take sodium by itself and it'll poison you. Chloride by itself is poisonous. But you put them together, and you got salt. And when you got salt, you got something that's very important. And that is something that's very, very important for us to see today. My favorite hymn has always been, Trust and Obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The gospel is for the obedience of faith, my beloved. And that is saving faith, and that's what Paul is talking about. Now he says, "...among whom are ye also the call of Jesus Christ? Now, the call, somebody says you're talking now about the elect, are you? Yes, that's right. And who are the call? Well, the call are those who heard. Some don't hear. The Lord Jesus, you know, made it very clear. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Now, my friend, if you're following somebody else or something else, you just haven't heard him. And he must not be your shepherd, because he says, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow him. And they're the ones that are called. I don't care about arguing about election. My friend, it's as simple as this. It's as simple as he called, and you answer. And if you haven't answered, you're not the elect. If you've answered, 
You're the elect. And that's about as far as my poor simple mind can follow that, by the way. And that is exactly what he's talking about here, the call of Jesus Christ. Then he says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God. Isn't that lovely? God loves those in Rome. And I was there. I want to tell you, there was a strike going on. And it's pretty hard to love anybody around there when you have to carry your suitcase up to your room and you can't get any kind of service and taxes are hard to get and you can't get around to see what you want to see. But God loves them. (laughs) The loved of God. How wonderful. And here we have it called to be saints. Well, that just doesn't simply answer the question at all. That word to be is not in the better manuscripts. They're called saints. That is, this is the name for every believer. Actually, a saint is not one who's been exalted. A saint is one who exalts Jesus Christ. There's a difference, by the way. And this idea you don't make saints by exalting mankind. A person becomes a saint when he exalts Jesus Christ and he becomes his Savior. Now, I want you to know today, it's a name for every believer. And there are only two classes of people in the world, saints and ain'ts. And you're a saint if you've trusted Christ. It's not your character that makes you a saint. It's your faith in Jesus Christ. It means you're set aside for him. That's all important to see, that you have been set aside You're beloved of God, and you've been called saints. That's the kind of a saint you are. You're like Paul, called an apostle. And as he called himself at the beginning, he's a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Now, I think it was Ketterling who made the statement that you either obey some person or some thing. Who do you obey? obeying someone today. A saint is one that has come to Jesus Christ, and he's that because he's trusted him and he's been set aside for Jesus Christ. And now he says, grace and peace to you. Will you notice that to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, call saints grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to have occasion in other epistles to talk about grace and peace. And I won't develop that here because we're going to have a great deal to say about the grace of God in this epistle. Now, this brings us down, actually, to the first division here. Under the introduction, we have Paul's personal greeting here. And isn't it a marvelous, profound thing? Now we have Paul's personal purpose. He wanted to go to Rome. Will you listen to him? First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now already the church in Rome that had come in existence, word had gone out to the very ends of the empire, had percolated out until that empire was saturated with the knowledge that there were many that were turning to Jesus Christ in Rome. So much so, it disturbed the emperors. Later on, persecution began. So Paul here mentions that. Your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I wonder about your group. Has anybody ever heard about you? Of Your testimony? What's it worth today? My, what a testimony this church in Rome had at the beginning. Now he says in verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. And this is something. We have it's the gospel of God. Paul's going to call it later on his gospel. Now it's the gospel of his Son. And will you notice here that without ceasing I make mention of you in my prayers. Paul had a long prayer list. When I was teaching Bible years ago in school, I had the students in the epistles list. Every time Paul said he was praying for somebody, make a list. 
And many of them were absolutely impressed by the fact that Paul had such a long prayer list. Well, he sure did. And he says that he prays without ceasing, making mention of you in my prayers, making requests, if by any means, how at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Now, he's talking about having a prosperous journey to come unto them. And if you read about his journey, it doesn't look like a prosperous journey. When as a prisoner, got into a storm, the ship was lost, he was bitten by a viper. Somebody says, you're going to call that a prosperous journey? Well, I think it was a prosperous journey. I have a friend that gives a series of messages on Paul's prosperous journey to Rome. Believe me, he makes it a very prosperous journey, by the way. Now, Paul mentions here why he wanted to go to Rome. He says he wants to come there by the will of God. And I think he went there by the will of God. And he says, I long to see you, in verse 11. And then he says, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. He wanted to come there and teach the Word of God. Paul loved to teach the Word of God. And when a preacher does not want to teach the Word of God, he becomes a clergyman. He becomes an administrator. He becomes a promoter. But he's not a man of God anymore. He's not a minister of the Word. And I've advised two or three men that have talked to me. One man says, I don't enjoy preaching anymore. And I says, for goodness sakes, get out of the ministry. You've got no business being in it today. Paul says that he wanted to come there to teach the Word of God. And he mentions in verse 12 the fourth reason, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. In other words, he not only communicate something, but they'd communicate something to him. They'd be mutually blessed in the Word. I had the privilege of speaking to a thousand students, many of them from the Berkeley campus. I laid it on the line for those folk, I'll tell you that. Maybe a little hard with them at the very beginning, and I saw how they responded. You know, they opened my eyes to a new world. I left that conference just singing, and I can't sing, but doing the best I could, just singing praises to God for the privilege of being there. May I say, Paul always was blessed in ministering to others. And that's what he's talking about here. Then he says, verse 13, he gives a fifth reason here. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let or hindered, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. You see, it was a Gentile church, largely. And Paul wanted to have fruit among them, By going there, many of them were his converts, as we've said. And now we have verses 14 through 17. He gives us his three I am's. He says, first of all, in verse 14, I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. By the way, that word barbarian could refer to Romans as well as it could to your ancestors and mine that were beyond the boundary of the Roman Empire in that day. But Paul said he was debtor to them. Now, how did he get in debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarian? Had Paul made a bill at the Greek restaurant over in Athens when he was there and didn't pay it? Had Paul sent to Rome to get some neckties and shoes? That's what Rome is famous for today, and he hadn't paid his bill. No, he'd had no transaction with these people at all. But he had had a personal transaction with Jesus Christ. And that transaction put him in debt to every man because the grace of God had been so bountifully bestowed upon him now it's put him in debt, not even to God, but it's made him a debtor out yonder to a lost world. Now, I hear today Christians make this statement. I pay my honest debts. Do you? Not until every person has heard the gospel have you and I paid our honest debts. 
Now, I was telling a preacher friend of mine, we were driving way in the interior in Turkey, and that country shut to the gospel. You get in trouble even propagandizing there. And as we were driving along, we came to a little town. Everything's in Turkish, and we felt very much as a stranger in a strange, strange land. But way down at the end of the street, there was a big sign. And you know what it said? (laughs) Coca-Cola. And I said to this friend of mine, I says, isn't it interesting that Coca-Cola has done a better job of advertising and getting out its message in the few years it's had than the gospel has had in 1900 years? Quite interesting. We haven't paid our debt, friends, till they've all heard. And there are multitudes that have not heard. Paul says, I'm debtor. And that is another reason he wanted to come to Rome. Then he has another, I am. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now, when he said, I'm debtor, he said, I'm ready to pay. Actually, He says, my side is ready. As Dr. Stifler says, he's master of his purpose, but not of his circumstance. And what he's saying here is, he's eager. He says, I'm eager to preach it. Oh, we need an enthusiasm and a high anticipation in our Christian life today in getting out the Word of God. Now, he says that I am debtor, and he says, I am ready. Then he says in verse 16, and we actually come now to the two verses that are the key to this great epistle. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, the word of Christ is not in the better manuscripts. I'll leave it out. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is not the righteousness, but a righteousness from God revealed, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, let's look at that. This is his third I am. I am debtor. I am ready. I am not ashamed. I am debtor. That's admission. I am ready. Remission. I'm not ashamed. Submission. That's the three missions of Paul. Admission, remission, and submission. Now he says here, I'm not ashamed. Why? Well, I walk down the streets of the ruins of Ephesus and looked at those ruins there of marble temples. But there's not a church that is ever built in Ephesus in that first century. You walk down the streets of the seven churches of Asia, and you see the ruins of gorgeous temples. In fact, in Ephesus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was there, the temple of Artemis, or Diana of the Ephesians. But no church. And there were great many that were saying, well, Brother Paul hasn't come to Rome because of the fact that After all, he's just preaching a message that goes to poor people, and he's preaching a message that it's not very prominent. There are no great temples built, no prestige connected with it. And therefore, Paul was ashamed to come to Rome. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now, why is he not ashamed of the gospel? It's the power. And the word here, power, is the word that we get our word dynamite from. It's dunamis. And it's dunamis power. And it's the kind of power that Dr. Vincent calls divine energy. And the important thing is, it in itself has an innate power. The gospel has power, my beloved, and it still has power. Now, it has power for very definite things. It's the power of God unto salvation. That's the end and the effect of the gospel. Salvation is the all-inclusive term of the gospel. And it simply means deliverance. And it has everything in it from justification to glorification. 
It's both an act and a process. It's equally true. I have been saved. I am being saved. I shall be saved. And it's to everyone. It embraces the entire human race, irrespective of racial or religious barriers. It's personal, for it's directed to every individual, and whosoever will may come. It's to everyone. But it's also limited to those that believe. It's universal in scope, but it's limited to those who believe. And you have election and free will wrapped up here together in this statement. The only way of procuring salvation is by faith. Now, it's to the Jew first and to the Greek. Now, let me give you my interpretation of this. I'm of the opinion that when it says to the Jew first, it doesn't mean the Jew has priority today. I think the important thing is to make sure the Jew's on a par with the Gentile, and he ought to be put on the par as far as evangelism is concerned. But here it's chronological. The gospel went first to the Jew, chronologically. Had you been in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, you'd have found out, my friend, that that was a Jewish meeting altogether. And it was Dr. Luke who wrote of Paul in Acts 13, 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So it went chronologically to the Jew first, and then it began at Jerusalem. That was a Jewish city. From Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now, Dr. Stifler again calls our attention to three very pertinent truths here. The effect of the gospel is salvation. The extent of it is the worldwide, everyone, and the condition is faith in Christ. Now, we are told that therein is not the righteousness of God, because that would be his attribute, and God's not sharing his attribute with anyone. The righteousness, it is a righteousness, and it's from God. And it's from God because of the fact that it's not man's righteousness. God has already said that he'll not accept the righteousness of man, for the righteousness of man's filthy rags in his sight, according to Isaiah. And this is the imputed righteousness of Christ, which places a lost sinner in Christ. And God sees him in Christ. And he is absolutely accepted because of what Christ has done for him. The only method of securing this righteousness is by faith. It's a by-faith righteousness. You can't work for it. You can't make a deposit for it. You can't buy it. You can't do anything except it by faith. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's what Paul told the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 9. Now, this is very important to see. It's a righteousness from God that's revealed now. And the word for righteousness is dikaiosune. A word occurs 92 times in the New Testament, 36 times here in Romans, and the phrase a righteousness from God occurs eight times. And the root word, dikai, just simply means right. It has in it justice, and to justify come from the same word. To be right is the primary meaning, and it's the antonym of sin. Sin means we're wrong, friends, and we're all wrong. Dr. Kramer gives this very apt definition. He says it's the state commanded by God and standing the test of his judgment, the character and acts of a man approved of him, in virtue of which the man corresponds with him, and his will as his ideal and standard. It's what God demands, and it's what God provides. A righteousness, if you please, that is from God. Now, it's very important, by the way, for us to see this. And we'll be talking about this righteousness a little bit later. So I just move on from this. And we're told here, as we read on in this very marvelous section... For therein is a righteousness of God revealed 
and it's from faith to faith. It simply means this. It means from faith or out of faith into faith. It means that God saves you by faith, you live by faith, you die by faith, you'll be in heaven by faith. And this is very important to see. I think I can use a very homely illustration. Quite a few years ago, more years than I like to think, I was born in the state of Texas. And when I was born, my mother said the doctor lifted me up by my heels, gave me a whack, and we live right deep in the heart of Texas. I could be heard at all borders. And I've always had a built-in loud speaker. I speak too loud. And so that's the way it happened. I was born into a world of atmosphere. And when I came into the world, he gave me that whack, so I began to breathe. And I took in atmosphere. And do you know something? From that day to this, I've still been breathing that stuff called air. From air to air. From atmosphere to atmosphere. From oxygen to oxygen. And I was saved in the state of Oklahoma. And when I was saved, it was by faith. And from that time on, it's been by faith, from faith to faith, from atmosphere to atmosphere. And that's what Paul means when he uses the expression like this. Now he says, as it's written, and the word that's quoted here comes from Habakkuk, the second chapter, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. And it's quoted in the three great epistles of the New Testament, Romans, Galatians, and in Hebrews. And justification by faith means that a sinner who trusts Christ is not only pardoned because Christ died, but that he stands complete in Christ before God. It means not only subtraction of sin, but addition of righteousness. And he was delivered for our offenses. He was raised for our justification. We might stand before God. Now, the act of God and justification by faith, it's not an arbitrary decision on his part. He does not disregard his holiness and his justice. Since God saves us by grace, this means that there's no merit in us. He saves us on no other ground than that we trust Christ. God is in danger of impugning his own justice if the penalty is not paid. He's not going to open the back door of heaven and slip sinners in under cover of darkness, and he's not going to let down the bars of heaven to bring you in, my friend. But he loved you, and Christ died for you to make our way. The penalty has been paid, and now we know that Christ paid the penalty for our sin, and our salvation rests upon through faith in his blood. He paid the penalty. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Now we have here a new section that's beginning. We have here a revelation of the wrath of God against all unrighteousness. We have here the revelation of the sin of man, beginning here at verse 18 through the 20th verse of the third chapter. And friends, this is cinerama. The universal fact is man is a sinner. And the ecumenical movement is always away from God. And the axiom you can put down here is the world is guilty before God and all need righteousness. Now, Paul is not attempting in this section to prove man's a sinner. You attempt to read it that way, you'll miss the point. All Paul is doing is stating the fact that man is a sinner. And first of all, he not only shows that there's a revelation of the righteousness of God, but there's the revelation of the wrath of God against the sin of man. Now we have here a natural revelation of God. This is the original version, by the way. And we don't have any translations of this one. You can read it in the original. Every one of us can do that. Listen to him. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Now, let's look at this for just a moment, because this is very important. The wrath of God. 
is revealed today. Actually, you want to know what salvation really is. You have to know how bad sin is. Stifler again says sin is the measure of salvation. Now, the wrath of God is God's feeling and not his punishment of sin. It's his holy anger. Wrath is the antithesis of righteousness, and it's used here as a correlative. It's being revealed. This is God's answer to those who assert that the Old Testament presents a God of wrath, while the New Testament presents a God of love. There is a continuous revelation of the wrath of God, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's revealed in our contemporary society. This is God's constant and insistent displeasure with evil. He changes not. God is merciful, not because he's lenient with the sinner, but because Christ died. The gospel has not changed God's attitude towards sin. The gospel has made it possible to accept the sinner. The sinner must have either the righteousness or the wrath of God. Both of them are revealed from heaven. And you can see it on every hand. You want to know how bad sin is? You look at the venereal diseases today. You don't get by with it. My friend, you don't get by with sin. Not at all. I'm not attempting today to give personal illustrations, but I've been a pastor long enough to see again and again the judgment of God upon sin. It's revealed from heaven. There will be a final judgment, and now it's against all ungodliness. Ungodliness is that which is against God. It's that which denies the character of God. The irreligiousness today. Those that disregard the existence of God. That's a state of the soul. God hates that. To deny him, not recognize him. That's sin. Unrighteousness. Now, unrighteousness is against man. Ungodliness is against God. Unrighteousness is against man. What does that mean? It's the denial of the rule of God. It's the action of the soul. That man that gets drunk, goes out on the freeway, breaks every traffic law, and kills someone. My friend, that's unrighteousness. He's sinning against man. The man that is dishonest in business, that man's unrighteous. God hates that. God will judge that. There are those that hold it down. They repress it. But may I say to you that the wrath of God is revealed against those because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Now there is this original revelation from God. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, this universe that you and I live in, it tells two things about God, his person and his power. And it's been from the time that the world was created. And it's clearly seen. How can invisible things be seen? Well, Paul made this a paradox purposely. When people say today, oh, the dim light of nature way back yonder at the beginning, man in the stone age, and he began to fall down when a tree fell in the wilderness and the lightning struck it. That's a man-made lie. Creation is as clear as anything possibly can be. Creation is one of God's methods of revelation and its primary revelation. The psalmist says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, why the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, his eternal power and deity power and person. Creation reveals the unchangeable power and existence of God. He's left himself without witness in that he did good. He gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our heart with food and gladness. And we are the offspring, not the sons of God, but the creation of God. And we ought not to think that Godhead's like unto gold or silver. There is that within man which so catches the meaning of all that's without as to issue in an instinctive knowledge of God. 
I think today the most ridiculous thing in the world is an atheist. He is the most illogical. He's the most senseless. He's the most stupid. For the fool hath said in his heart, that word fool means insane person. You're insane when you deny the existence of God. It's a great universal fact that man is totally depraved. And there is an ecumenical movement, but it's not toward God, it's away from God. And the whole world stands guilty before God, and all need righteousness which they cannot supply at all. You see that God cannot save man by perfection, because man can't present it. And he can't save man by imperfection, because he is holy. So God has had to step in and provide man a salvation. The question is, does he need it? And Paul puts down here these basic facts that man is a sinner before God. Now, if he isn't a sinner, he doesn't need a Savior. And the measure of salvation, of course, is the measure of sin. And it's what you think of yourself that will determine what you think of Christ. If you are self-sufficient, you won't need him at all. And if you see yourself in need of a Savior, then you will turn to him. That is all important. Now, Paul's not trying to prove here man's a sinner. He's merely stating facts that are quite obvious. Now, he has said that there's a natural revelation of God. Nature has enough in it to keep man on the track today. That is, that there is a God, and that this God has power. Now, very candidly, that natural revelation of God ought to bring man to the place where he bows before his Creator, and when he does, then he'll find out that there is a special revelation of God. And that special revelation of God is in the Word of God, and that reveals the fact that today this Creator came down to this earth and that he entered into humanity and became one of us. And he walked here. He took upon himself our humanity with his weaknesses. And he died, suffered, and bled and died upon a cross to reveal the love of God. And friends, you're not going to find the love of God out in nature. I know the poets talk about babbling brooks, but the very fact that the brooks babble in summer mean that most of them are frozen up in winter, and you just don't sit down and meditate there. Nature is not at all kind. Nature can be very cruel. We stood over yonder in Turkey on the ruins of Pergamos and looked down. My friend, one step, and you'd step into eternity because of the law of gravitation. And the love of God wouldn't stop you one inch on the way down. Why? Because the love of God is revealed in one place, and that is the cross of Christ. And if you could convince me today that God was just a spectator to this little universe, and that that's all that he did was create it, and that was all that he did demonstrated his tremendous power, then I'd be prepared to turn my back upon him, but he didn't do that. He's revealed his love. And that love is revealed towards sinners, that he loved us and he gave himself for us. What a glorious truth that is here. Now, he speaks here in verse 21 of the fact that these who have even a natural revelation, he says, "...because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God." Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You examine that rather carefully, you'll see that there are seven steps that mankind took down from the Garden of Eden. And there's been no such thing as a man stepping upward and moving upward. This verse contradicts the theory, hypothesis of evolution. Man is neither going up physically, nor is he going up morally, nor is he going up intellectually, nor is he going up spiritually. Man is 
a creature that his tendency is to go downward, and the pull is downward. And there was a time when they knew God. Now, I grant that this contradicts Fraser's The Rainbow Bridge. It contradicts all anthologies of religion that start in with man in a very primitive condition as some sort of a caveman with very little intellectual qualities and that he began to move upward intellectually. And as he did, why, somehow or another, he began to move toward God. Now, is that the truth? Absolutely not. Man is moving away from God. And right now, the world is probably farther from God than it's ever been in any time in its history. And the fact of the matter is that every primitive tribe has a record. It has a tradition that way back in the beginning, they knew God. Dr. Vincent put it like this. He says, I think it may be proof from facts that any given people, down to the lowest savages, has at any period of its life known far more than it has done known quite enough to enable it to have got on comfortably, thriven and developed. If it had only done what no man does, all that it knew it ought to do and could do. No people have ever even lived up to the light that they've had. And even the savage has never done that. And they have a tradition, a record, that way back in the beginning that they did worship the living and the true God. But when they knew God, they moved away from him. What? They glorified him not as God. They did not give him his place, and man became self-sufficient. No wonder that man has made the announcement in our day that God is dead. They didn't make that announcement in days gone by. They just turned their back upon him and made man God. But today they've come to the place where they want to pronounce him dead. They glorified him not as God. And then the third step, neither were thankful. And I suppose that ingratitude is one of the worst sins that there is. You can't think of anything that is worse than that. Ingratitude, that departure from God that reaches down. I think it's Shakespeare that said, I hate ingratitude more in a man than lying, vainness, babbling, drunkenness, or any taint of vice. The ten lepers healed, but only one came back to thank the Lord. Percentage is about 10%. May I say I don't think it's that today. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. And fourth, but they became vain in their imagination. And they concocted a hypothesis of evolution There have been all kinds of philosophies about the creation of the world. There is one that goes back to the fact that this earth that was created, the way that it is held up, it was put on an elephant's back, and that the elephant stood on four turtles, a foot on each turtle. And then somehow or another they forgot to tell us what the turtles stand on. And the interesting thing is evolution is just about as silly as that. It takes you way back, millions and billions of years. You get lost in that type of thing, of course. And then you reduce it down to some little protoplasm, something that becomes just a little atom, and that out of that has come everything. Why, my friend, that is just about as ridiculous as the world standing on an elephant, resting on an elephant. Or maybe it was Atlas that was holding it up. And Atlas was standing on an elephant. Well, anyway, friends, anyway you look at it, you've got to have a foundation somewhere back there. And they became vain in their imaginations. Fifth, their foolish heart was darkened. And they moved into the darkness of paganism. My friend, all you've got to do is to walk down the streets of Cairo, Egypt today, Istanbul, Turkey, Los Angeles, California, to know that their foolish heart is darkened today. Six, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, it's the fool that saith in his heart, there is no God. And that word means insane. A friend of mine who's had wonderful success in dealing with so-called atheists, 
He heard a man one time proclaiming at the top of his voice to a group. He was an atheist. He didn't believe that there was a God. My friend waited until he ran out of hot air. And then he said to him, he said, did I understand you right that you do not believe there's a God? He said, that's right. I don't believe there's a God. Well, he says, you know, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And that word for fool is insane. Now, I said, either you were insincere when you made that statement, or you're insane. Which is it? You're insane, or you're insincere. You have to be one or the other. What is it? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, notice the next step, and this is the seventh step in the last one. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Now, the unsaved world has a caricature of God. Look at the images and the idols of the heathen. You can go to any people, and most of them are very frightful. I was very much interested in visiting the ruins of the ancient city of Ephesus. That city probably in the Roman Empire reached the highest degree of culture and civilization than any cities ever reached. Yet at the heart of that city was one of the most horrible images that is imaginable. And it was in the temple that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple of Artemis. And that image is of Diana, greatest Diana of the Ephesians. Now, this Diana was not the lovely image that you see in Greek sculpture. She was the goddess of the moon. Her brother ran the sun. He was on the day shift, and she was on the night shift, you see. So that she's quite lovely, the pictures I've seen of her. But this one of Artemis, or Diana, is not quite that. In fact, it's like the Oriental Sibyl, the mother goddess, the many-breasted one. She had in one hand a trident and in the other a club. And believe me, my friend, she's mean. <laughs> That's the idea that the most cultured, civilized people had a god. Female principle, gross immorality took place around that temple. Dishonesty of the worst sort. May I say to you, what did they do? Why, they turned the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man. And Paul told the Athenians, said, you cannot take the Creator and make a caricature of him, actually a cartoon. And idolatry is merely a cartoon of God, and it's a slander and slur against him. And may I say this, and I say it carefully, because I know right now I'll sting a great many of the saints, because they go in for it today. I personally do not like to see pictures of Jesus. We know him no longer after the flesh, Paul says. He is the glorified Christ, and he's not that picture you got hanging on the wall, my friend. He today is the one, if he did come into where your room is, you would go down on your face before him. He's the glorified Christ today. Don't slur our God by having a picture of him. The Greeks made their gods like men. And the Assyrians and the Egyptians and the Babylonians made their gods look like beasts and birds and creeping things. And I walked through that museum yonder in Cairo and looked at some of those gods they've made. They're not very flattering, let me tell you. Man did not begin in idolatry. The savage of today and primitive man are not the same. Primitive man was monotheistic. Idolatry was introduced later. Why, the first record we have of idolatry is in connection with Rachel stealing her father's idols. And man has descended downward. He did not develop upward at all. The very interesting thing is that Sir William Ramsey, who had one time been a unbeliever, he says, For my part, I confess that my experience and reading show nothing to confirm the modern assumptions in religious history 
and a great deal to confirm Paul. Whatever evidence exists with the rarest exceptions, the history of religion among men is a history of degeneration. Is it not the fact of human history that man standing alone degenerates and that he progresses only where there is in him so much sympathy with and devotion to the divine life as to keep the social body pure and sweet and healthy. And that's the reason today that all of these programs, poverty programs, health programs, bankrupt in this country. Why? Because of gross immorality and turning away from the living and true God. They talk about we want to be practical and we don't want to introduce religion. My friend, that's the problem today, that the only practical thing for man to do is to turn to the living and true God. Now, what happened? We have here the results of this revolution against God. Three times now in the remainder of this chapter, it says, "...wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves." Now, if you want to know how far man goes down in immorality, it's always measured by this matter of sex. And this perversion, this thing that actually many of the churches are espousing, instead of condemning it, may I say to you that God says he's given them up. They changed the truth of God into a lie. They worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this, notice again, verse 26, For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Now these are passions of dishonor and disgrace. And this is depravity. I don't care what they're saying today, my friend. May I say to you, all you're doing today is getting public opinion of depraved minds. And perversion is something that entered into Greek life, and it brought Greece down. And you want to know how far down go over and look there today. The glory that was Greece has passed away. And they did that which was unseemly. And verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And anybody that tells me today you can be a child of God and live in perversion and live in this sex maya today, my friend, you're not kidding anybody but yourself. And if you come to Jesus Christ, he'll give you deliverance today. Now they're being filled here, we're told, with all unrighteousness. And then he gives the ugliest list here. I hope you get my book on Romans and go through this. I do not intend to go through this ugly, horrible list. But it's what Los Angeles does every day. I used to tell students... Buy any paper, any cosmopolitan paper, any of our metropolitan dailies, and sit down and pick out the headlines, and you can find a headline for every sin that's mentioned here. This is what mankind does. This is the condition of Los Angeles today. Not just Cairo, Egypt, not Calcutta, India, not China, but the United States. And how much longer will God tolerate us? And be patient with us, because he's judged great nations of the past who went in this direction. Now, this is a horrible, frightful picture of humanity. But right now, there are folk listening to me and saying, Yes, Dr. McGee, we agree with you. Down there in the underworld, it's terrible, but we are nice folk. We have our little church socials. <laughs> we are lovely folk. We are members of a church. We don't really need a savior because we're so nice and sweet and moral. My friend, the meanest people I've ever met have been church people, and you must remember, I've been a pastor 35 years. I know some mean people. They're church members. 